Welcome back to Jacques in the Garden. We are in the early weeks of February and I figured now's actually a great time to show you guys my garden. We have this section which I call the South Garden and then we have the North Garden which is currently my favorite. But let's start here because there is a lot to see. First thing I want to show you guys is this bed down here where I've been planting some very dense lacinato kale. Now lacinato kale is a really versatile wonderful one because you could cook with it in soups, you could use it for kale chips, you could eat it fresh for salads, and it has such a nice vibrant dark green color. What you see next to it is actually my husky cherry tomato, which has been in the ground, I think maybe September. And it does look a little bit sad right now, but it has been producing all winter long. And I'm not mad about that for an outdoor winter tomato. Now, right behind me, we do have some more greens, some of my favorites. I have the green Beatola de Costa Fine chard. And in front of that, I have a mixture of some leftover starts that I didn't have space for in the other garden. So I moved them over here. I have uh, two broccolis, a red acres cabbage. I honestly don't even remember what that one is. It might be a green cabbage. And then all throughout it, what you're looking at is golden beets. So all of these right here are golden beets that I transplanted from a 16 cell. And yes, you can transplant beets and it's totally fine. They make a great filler to kind of fill out any empty spots in your garden bed. They grow pretty quickly, so they won't get in the way of other plants. And that way you get the most out of your soil especially during the rainy season where there is plenty of water in here for all these plants to be supported and to thrive. Now, what you're looking at right behind me though is my wall of peas. So a lot of these snow peas, they are actually starting to size up quite big. Generally, you'll wanna actually harvest them like at this size, but let me take a big one down here where you have like the giant peas actually fully visible in there and they start to look weird on the pod. Cause this is a pea where you wanna eat the whole thing. If it starts having scarring like that, it's not gonna be as appetizing. Now in terms of the biggest size, you can go that big and it'll still be nice and tender and delicious. So snow peas, very versatile. You could eat them fresh, you could cook with them in a saute. Very delicious, one of my favorites. In front of it is something new to me. It's actually sorrel. So this is a, I believe it's a perennial green. It bunches very aggressively. So down here, there's, you can't tell how many like plants are down in there, but each one is multiple clumps of leaves and it has this very lemony, strong flavor. It's not something where I would eat it as a standalone meal, but it's something that's really delicious thrown into like a potato soup. It'll add a nice zingy green element to that. And it's just a really easy to grow plant. It's just leaves constantly and I haven't had to do anything to it whatsoever. And it's just nonstop production over here. So happy to add that to my garden this year. It'll probably be one that I continue to keep in the garden year after year. Now working our way down, we have some of my older lacinato kale. You could see just how tall these guys could get. This is actually two kale stalks that are coming out of the same stalk. So it's just one plant here with two heads forming these kales. And that's one of these cool things I didn't realize about kale until I started growing it in my own garden. Is it could be very perennial. It could grow for a very long time. This plant alone is actually, actually over two years old. So quite old, still producing just fine. And it's even branching and creating new heads. This guy over here, I just recently started to appreciate. That's my tree collard. And it has these leaves that turn purple as they get older. But like right here is the perfect stage for eating this kind of uh, plant. It's still nice and tender, but it's very thick walled. It's a very hearty green. This is really fantastic in soups, stu uh, soups and beans, things like that. It's got quite a delicious flavor. This year, having grown it through the winter and eating it at the right time, it's also been very sweet. If you eat this during the summer, it'll be closer to like a collard, maybe a little bit more bitter. But in the winter time, I found this to be incredibly sweet and delicious and it's a perennial. So this has been in here since the garden started at least three years now. It's just, I chop it down every once in a while, it grows back. Right now there's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, who knows how many different heads coming out of that. So very cool plant and I'm happy to have it in my garden now that I finally appreciate eating it. As we round the corner, I have some more kale over here, but we <laughs> talked plenty about that. I wanted to quickly touch on my grape here. This is the flame seedless grape. Now last year I had plans to eat a lot of delicious grapes, but I got a little bit greedy. I did not thin it out enough. And what happened was that all the grape leaves had powdery mildew, that powdery mildew spread into the fruit, all the fruit cracked and it was unedible. So this year I actually cut back a lot more. So I'm actually probably gonna even cut this out entirely and just leave two liters and that's it. Cause once it gets too bushy and dense in there, there's not enough airflow and your grapes are just gonna suffer and you think you're getting more, but I actually got zero. So don't make that mistake. It is not worth it. Right now is their favorite time of year. They are absolutely thriving. And this is a bed that kind of got overtaken. It's supposed to be carrots in here. If I try to pull one, but the soil is so wet. Oh yeah, there it is. Actually a really nice carrot right there. 
So these are carrots that I saved seed from. Uh, I had a few flowering plants over there. And all I did is I took the seed heads and I just kind of went like this and just let them fall where they landed. And they produced some wonderful carrots. I've actually been eating a few of these. Incredibly sweet when you grow them in the winter. Most vegetables will sweeten during the winter time due to the cold weather. They start producing sugars. So if you think your carrots taste bitter and gross, maybe it's because you're growing them in the summertime instead of the cooler seasons where they get nice and delicious. Again, this is kind of a mixture of starts that I just didn't have space for as I cycled this bed out and put new stuff in. I actually discovered a major issue here, which was that this giant shrub next to me had invaded from underneath the driveway all of its roots into this bed. And so this soil was bone dry last time I kind of took a look inside of it. So what I did is I broad forked it, I dug a huge channel over here, and I just cut all the roots as much as I could. And then I put in some metal flashing to block any new root growth. Right now what you're looking at is I have a couple oddballs here. Right here and here, these are rutabagas. So they will get a nice big root crop. And we grew it once before and we quite enjoyed it. It turns out that it makes a really nice creamy mash. It's not a potato for sure, but it is still quite delicious for not being a potato. Then everything else that you see is very heavily interplanted. So for example, right here is a garlic clove, another garlic, another garlic. And the idea behind this is that these are all cabbages. They're actually the, um, I believe the Caraflex cabbage that makes the nice rounded cone. And a few people told me that putting your alliums in between your brassicas will actually deter your aphid problems and even your cabbage loopers. I had the space to fill these in, so I figured let's give it a try. If this bed is free of pests, once these especially start growing in, I'll definitely keep you guys updated. And actually on this side, the other allium I have growing are my leeks. These are Bulgarian giant leeks. And the secret with leeks really is that you wanna bury them as deep as you possibly can. So if you take a look at this, what you'll notice is that both of these leek rows are essentially in a trench. So right now there is a divot here. What I would do is I would take the soil and actually hill up against these leeks as they continue to get taller. Any part of the leek that is covered by soil and doesn't get light will turn that nice white color that makes that tender sweet leek like the ones that you get at the grocery store. Next to that over here are my beets. I have quite a few of these red beets. These are the robin beets that are a little bit smaller. So the plan with these is to actually pickle them, which is very delicious if you haven't tried pickled beets before. Um, one last thing I'll mention behind me here is a kind of funny looking plant, one that you've maybe never seen before. This is called spigarello. So it is actually a broccoli essentially, but instead of eating the flowers like the florets, you actually eat the leaves. And if you look at them, they're very twisted and curly. That's the nature of this kind of plant. And I had this at an Italian restaurant with like, I think it was gnocchi. And I was like, I've never heard of this green. What the heck is it? I was surprised to learn it was a broccoli. And so I got some seeds because it is very delicious. It'll have a nice sweetness to it. It cooks down really, really wonderfully. This you guys might remember is actually where I put my grafted tomato. Now I kept telling myself I would get rid of it. Then it kept doing better. So I didn't get rid of it. And ultimately what I decided to do was not get rid of it. All I did is I came down to the base here and I chopped it. I was like, let's just see what happens. It's starting to regrow. And it actually doesn't seem to have any major disease. There's like a couple of leaves that maybe are wilted back a little bit, but I'm honestly a little bit curious to see what this does. This has the grafted rootstock at the base with the Cherokee purple up top. So this is Cherokee purple growth right here. If it continues to grow well, I will just leave it here and we'll see if we get an early crop of Cherokee purples off this grafted guy. So very fun little experiment here. Probably shouldn't do it because the longer you leave a tomato on the ground, the more chances are that it's going to develop disease that then might spread to other plants, but I play it risky and loose pretty often here. As we wrap our way around over here, quick update is that the mushroom bed has been fruiting nonstop. This has been fruiting maybe every three weeks since I put it in. We've pulled dozens and dozens of mushrooms out of here. At this stage, what I've done is I've actually just let them, instead of harvesting them, you can see they have this kind of gross paley color. What happens is that they will actually spore. So they will shoot all their spores out from the bottom and that's gonna go into the soil or actually the wood chips and mulch here. And that's going to help propagate these mushrooms. I did not put any mushroom spawn in this particular area. It was all on this backside. So even at this point, I already know it's spreading into my garden. The last thing I wanna mention over here is, well, we have this raised bed, but it's actually been pretty harvested out. There's a couple of lettuces in there, but that's it. Not much exciting to mention there. But what you'll see over here, the biggest borage that I've ever grown, like look at the trunk on this guy, absolutely massive. 
really wild. This is a self-seeded borage. Borage is very prolific at self-seeding and does it without anyone asking it to whatsoever. The cool thing about borage is, well, the thing that I hate about it is that it's spiky, first of all. It could be a little bit annoying. But the cool thing is, is it makes these tiny blue flowers. These are actually edible. Oftentimes you'll see them in fancy salads or in cocktails. They have like a very mild, almost um, sweet cucumber taste is how I could best describe it. But this color is very attractive to bees as well. The other plant you might be curious about that you see right here is fava beans. So these are the fava bean flowers. And then down here, there's like little baby fava beans. But this is a wonderful cover crop nitrogen fixer. I put it in this bed because I have some overwintered peppers in the ground. And if you leave overwintered peppers in the ground and you get too much rain, we've actually had over eight inches of rain these past two months. So that's quite a bit for San Diego they will drown in the ground. So by putting things around there like fava beans, that helps suck up some of that moisture and stop those plants from dying while also adding some nitrogen back into your soil. Now, as I mentioned, I do like this side of the garden, but the other side right now is definitely my favorite. So let's go take a look at that. There's a lot of really cool stuff going on there. And here we are in the North Garden, my current favorite for a variety of reasons that you'll soon see. There's a lot of variety going on in here. Some things that are full maturity, past maturity, and almost there. So it'll be really fun to walk around and show you all that. First thing I wanted to point out is right down here is my sweet pea patch. So the idea behind this is it'll climb up this trellis, produce nice, wonderful smelling blooms. Every time you walk by here, it's gonna smell absolutely wonderful. So I'm expecting those to bloom probably within the next like two to three weeks. And I'm very much looking forward to that. Down here, this huge vibrant green bush is actually an herb called sweet marjoram. This is an extremely perennial plant here in San Diego. And it's really cool because it self roots extremely easily. I could come down here, pull a clump out near the base, it'll be rooted. I could give it to the friend and they could grow it in their garden. This is something that I would say is like, kind of like a mix of oregano, thyme, like almost a little bit basil-y, but very delicious, prolific, multi-purpose herb, highly recommend. One thing that's interesting is that some peppers do actually like the cold weather a lot more than others. Off the top of my head, the Mad Hatter is one, the Bikino pepper is another, and the Chiliano pepper is another one that produces all throughout the winter with no problem. No foliage issues either, they just look incredible. All I did is chop this guy back, and this Mad Hatter is gonna start producing pretty soon here, which is really cool to see. Now this bed over here is entirely planted with hard nut garlic. These are all garlics that I had kept in my refrigerator for on the order of maybe a month or two. And so I actually put them in quite late and they've already started to grow really nicely. So the idea behind this is that by keeping them in the fridge, I've tricked them into experiencing winter. And this is also the coldest bed in my garden where I actually got frost on the surface of my soil. So I think it'll do quite well here. And they already look super happy and healthy. One thing I did differently this year is that you could see that the bed is actually quite high off the ground, maybe like four to six inches, which should allow more drainage and reduce the chances of that dreaded garlic rust that really decimated my crop that was over in this bed last year. So I did move beds and I made it much higher to try to give it a little drainage and avoid that problem. Now behind me is probably my favorite brassica and that is the broccolini. So broccolini is a wonderful sprouting type of broccoli. It's a cross between uh, the Chinese gailan and broccoli if I remember correctly. So you get these nice, honestly perfect florets. The stem is very tender, sweet and juicy. So you can eat the whole thing no problem. They saute up easily, they air fry, bake very quickly. And honestly, I just love coming out here and just grabbing a bundle of like mini florets just like this and already pre-chopped. So real time saver in the kitchen. Now, one thing I'll point out is that if it looks like this, this is on its way to flowering or bolting. So this is a little bit past its prime. You could eat it, but it will be bitter, whereas this will be sweet and delicious. So broccolini, easy favorite. Also, the leaves are actually quite edible and tasty as well. So down here is one of the first herb beds that I put in. The sage is starting to come back now. The winter savory is really starting to put on new growth, which I'm very happy to see. And of course I have a lot of thyme mixed in here that's doing really, really wonderfully. Down over here is a plant that many people struggle to grow in their garden. And it's all about timing. So right here is the humble Brussel sprout and they cannot tolerate heat. If they get too much heat, they will bolt and they will not taste good. They'll be covered in aphids. I think the reason why this is a little bit looser than I would like is because it's actually not getting very much sun. So not ideal, but this is still a really tasty, perfect Brussels sprout for eating. Save that guy for later and come back and harvest that plant in a bit. Now, if there was one cabbage that was the most beautiful, I would say it's the red acre cabbage. Right here, I have an example of one that's actually starting to firm up nicely. So when it comes to growing cabbage, it's really about that squeeze test. You'll have a general idea of the size of the cabbage, but if you come down 
give it a pinch and it's kind of loose, then it's not ready. It should feel really firm and tight and that is a nice cabbage head. So these guys, I'd say they're less than a month away from being ready. So right over here is an example of a multi-grafted fruit tree. This is a four in one low chill plum. So what that means is that this branch, this branch, this one, and the one closest to me are all different varieties. They are four different plums on the same stock. So down here is just a rootstock that's gonna provide all the water and nutrients. And each one of these is going to produce their own unique fruit. They could even have entirely different colors. Some of these might be pink, some of them might be like more orange. And the thing that you'll notice is that I have pruned it pretty aggressively and the branches that are skinnier, I pruned less. That's because they have less energy potential than something that's thick like this crazy guy. So this guy got the lowest prune job. These guys were kept taller. And then the one that's doing sort of so-so is a little bit tall, but not as thin down as some of the others. So now what is going to happen is that this will leaf out. It might block a little bit of sun back here, but this is going to be plenty vigorous because of how thick this is. So I should be able to get four different plum varieties off this single tree. I'm very excited to see that. Back here, you'll see the chickens have been getting all of the leftover spent <laughs> brassica plants. So these are the broccolis at the end of the season. You can see how many branches. But when I'm done harvesting and I feel like they're past their prime, I just take the plant out of the ground, throw it to the chickens, and <laughs> they definitely do some work on it. Uh, down here, this is just some forage that I grew that they're picking at. And then over here is more fruit trees. So this is two pear trees. The varieties that I went with here is Hood European, which is a low chill, 100 to 200 hour chill and Florida Home, which is a funny name. It's also low chill at 300 hours. So these are two trees that are planted extremely close together. That was on purpose. This is a two-in-one tree planting. And the idea behind that is that these will pollinate each other to help increase the yield. By planting them closer together, they will probably produce less than if they were given more space. But overall, this will be net more than one single tree. Here, here, here is the rest of my garlic. I have a lot of different garlics going. You guys saw the one over there, but this was the first garlic I put in and I've had uh, the curse that I think Kevin transferred to me. For a few years there, he was growing garlic and every single time a skunk would come and dig out his garlic and ruin it. And that's been happening to me right over here. So this patch that's a little bit bare has been dug out. But the other thing I've noticed is that this bed, I just didn't fertilize very heavily when I planted it. Whereas this guy over here, I fertilized very heavily. Now over here, is my four by eight bed, which I have been actually harvesting out quite aggressively. But the thing that you're seeing right now is the burgundy broccoli from Botanical Interest. If you had to grow just one broccoli because you didn't have space or you didn't know which one to choose, I would choose this one. It's very beautiful. It's insanely prolific. All of this has been harvested so many times, I can't even begin to tell you. Every one of these stalks that you see is essentially a new side shoot. So this has been dumping broccoli on us for weeks now, from December literally until now, I've been harvesting massive quantities of broccoli just like this on a very regular basis to the point where I was literally giving out bouquets of broccoli to whoever was coming and visiting. This bed is actually my partner Katrina's. She's starting to fill it in with uh, tea herbs. So in this back half, it's all chamomile. All these little guys here is chamomile and they will start producing very shortly. I see the little tiny flower buds there. And more of our favorite green chard here, the Costa, the Biotola, Fine. As we work our way back here, this is actually my favorite section of the garden right now. And I think you'll see why. These cabbages just look so, so cool. I'm absolutely in love with how they look. There's a mixture of the uh, red acre cabbage and the Copenhagen green cabbage. And there's also some fiddler kraut, that conehead cabbage as well. Over here are all my onions. I have four different kinds. I have a white, a red, and two different yellow onions. And right here is my rain basin capture system. So this is the video that I posted recently about my greenhouse and how I was trying to get it off grid. What you'll see is that all these wood chips are still very damp because we got plenty of rain. Now we got so much rain that I was starting to actually think these might wash away, but they never did. They actually stayed totally in place. They've been slowly working that water into the soil. So all the roof of my greenhouse, all the rain that hits it, gets piped into this channel, which wraps around this bed and it totally was able to handle it just fine. So I'm very happy to see that I could handle rain up to four inches in just a couple days because that's hopefully realistically the only amount of rain we're going to get in San Diego. If we get more than that, we're definitely going to start having problems here just like LA had recently. On my right here is actually my Hugel culture bed. And what you're seeing right now is actually a field of wheat with a nice little pop of nasturtiums up here. So this is all wheat. The bottom of the, or the top of the Hugel culture mound is right here. It's like maybe a foot off the ground. 
The idea behind planting wheat here was that wheat has like very deep penetrating roots, so it has a very good ability of holding soil in place. Since this was, this was literally a mound of soil, if I didn't plant it with something like wheat, that all could have washed away during our recent rainstorms. But as we work our way all the way to the back of this garden now, what you'll see is the last of the fruit trees that I put in ground right now. This is another multi-grafted tree. I actually recorded a whole video on how I planted this because this is using a method called the multi-year hole, which you'll learn much more about in that video. Basically, the idea behind it is that you are going to be saving yourself years of growth by preparing the soil very, very heavily. So this is three different peaches. I don't think I mentioned that. One is Florida Prince, Mid Pride, and then Eva's Pride, which is the number one peach at Kenneth's house by far. So I know that's going to do well here. And around that I've planted some hollyhocks over here and I've seeded in a little bit of sunflowers to give a nice height contrast. Now working our way down, this Pride of Madeira is going to have a wonderful flowering year with all the rain that we had. So I'm very much looking forward to that. But we are going to take a look at the greenhouse after I give you an update. This is the last of my garlic here. These are all the teeny tiny cloves that I thought were too small to bother putting in the ground to get a big bulb. So what I did is I put them all inside a grow bag like this. And what you get is tons of green garlic here. So right here, this is a perfect little snack of green garlic. My parents like to eat this raw. So I'm honestly probably gonna just save this all and give it to them. You can eat it raw, it's very healthy for you. But you can also chop it up, saute it, put it in like ramen soups as a topper. And you'll get a very strong, delicious garlic flavor without having to get into the bulb. And you can use the entire thing from the bottom all the way to the ends of the green. So now let's take a look at that greenhouse because there's quite a lot going on in there as well. So now we're in the greenhouse, which is Cosmo's favorite place <laughs> by far. He spends most of his day in here chilling on the chair. I guess it's Cosmo's chair now. But the strawberries are continuing to do really wonderfully. Again, if you haven't grown a everbearing strawberry, Seascape or Albion are both really great. They're self fertile, so you don't need pollinators. They're great inside of a greenhouse situation. Now working our way down, I have two cherry tomatoes. They look honestly incredible. Like <laughs> maybe some of the healthiest tomatoes I've had growing in containers by far. And actually even down here, we have the first early girl tomato just about ready. Early girl, true to its name, is a nice sized tomato that produces even early on before spring has even arrived. So very cool, I love that. And there's quite a bit on that plant for sure. Now the rest of these you guys have seen before. It's just kind of the leftovers of my trees I still haven't put in the ground. They're doing really well inside the greenhouse. No complaints about that. On this side I have all of my seedlings. I'm actually starting to think I need to build a third shelf up here because <laughs> I'm running out of space. Down here are some of the overwintered peppers that I dug out in a prior vlog. And as you can see, this is exactly what you want. You want them to create new growth points. And if they ever get too crowded, like over here, there's one, two, three, four. I might pinch off this one there just so that they don't crowd each other too much. That's all you're really doing with overwintered peppers is controlling where you want the growth and controlling the height as much as you can. You will get some dieback like this guy over here. And I should have gotten some pruners, but that broke off pretty easy. So any dead stuff like that, go ahead and take it off. It's not gonna serve you any favors. The other thing in the back here is I have some dragon fruit cuttings that I'm rooting from Kevin's house. This is the sugar dragon and um, sour patch kids. So they're both self-fertile dragon fruits, which are the only ones I'm gonna bother growing with. I don't wanna have to collect pollen <laughs> into all that transfer in the night situation. So that is what's going on there. I have, oh, I'll give you guys an update. In my other video that I did, uh, everything I'm growing right now, I think was the title. But basically I showed you guys how I use the 16 cells to grow things like little gem lettuce, the Vivian lettuce and the spinach. This is exactly what you're looking for. So at this stage, I would say that this is transplant ready right now. It has two to three true leaves and that's all it really needs. And this is not that much soil, remember guys. So you don't wanna leave these in for too long in these trays, but for a bunch of plants, when you're growing a lot of lettuce or a lot of spinach, this is really the best use case for them. Now on this section, I actually have all of my peppers. So you'll see right here that they're on a heat mat. Even inside the greenhouse, you want the soil to be nice and warm through the night. It's going to make peppers germinate much, much faster than if they're unheated. Wherever you're growing your peppers, throw them on a heat mat and they will do much better. The other thing I'm doing here is I'm experimenting with growing peppers in the tiny 16 cells. We've seen professional growers basically grow in something even smaller than this. The idea behind this is that you have less soil. Less soil means that you have less chance of rotting, which is a huge problem with peppers. They don't like too much water. And less soil means that it's also easier for this heat mat to get the heat all the way up to the top where the seeds actually are. Underneath is my tomato tray. And if you wanna see all of the varieties that I'm growing in terms of peppers and tomatoes, I actually just shot a video 
and the link for that will be right here. So thanks for watching guys. Hope you guys learned something. Let me know what you want to see next.